So the first half of this course, right, concentrated on the structure of microbes, right? We did a lot of, we looked at a lot of structural components. The second half, as you guys have started to realize, right, we've kind of shifted gears a little bit, and we're concentrating more on uh, how the microbes function. What can they do, right? Um, so almost like anatomy and physiology, right? Structure and function, right? What does it look like? How does it function? So things like does it have a capsule is a structural component, right? Questions like what we're going to be asking today as we looked at our results, can they ferment sugars, right? Can they do this particular ability? So a lot of the tasks that we looked at today um, deal with fermentation, right? Different things that they have the ability to do. And they help us differentiate, right? Can they do this? Can they not? Right? These are differential tests. And we're going to continue this theme one last time next week. The selective media that you guys inoculated today are going to tell you and help confirm some of the results that you're getting as you're figuring out what your unknown is today. If you don't know today, right, you've hopefully narrowed it down to two or three. And those um, results from the plate media are going to help confirm. So a little bit of chemistry involved, right, because these are chemical reactions. So redox reactions are the oxidation which is the loss of electrons, and reduction, which is the gain of electrons. So if some molecule loses electrons, the other one is going to gain it in the reactions. So uh, saying that I learned long time ago is oil rig, to help you remember what, um, O for oxidation, L for loss. Oxidation is the loss, oil. Rig, R-I-G, reduction is the gain of electrons. Some people know other little sayings, but that one seems to really stick with you for a long time. So the electrons don't disappear, right? They're just moving from one place to another. So if somebody's oxidized, someone else is reduced. In um, biochemical systems, the electrons don't usually move all by themselves. Sometimes they move with uh, protons. A hydrogen atom is just an electron and a proton, right? A hydrogen ion is basically a proton. And so in these systems, a lot of times you'll see whole hydrogen atoms moving, right? Um, the proton and the electron, the whole hydrogen atom moving, right? But that hydrogen atom does contain an electron, right? So there are electrons that are moving. So um, there are a lot of molecules that obviously help carry electrons from one place to another. Uh, one of those being, this looks weird to me, huh? I'm worried about my recording. I opened. All right. So we talked about redox. So, for this electron carrier, this molecule, abbreviated NAD, it's actually a modified nucleotide. Nucleotides make up DNA and RNA. So, there's your phosphate group, there's your sugar group, and here's your nitrogenous base. Um, and then for this, instead of having another nitrogenous base, it has a modified one. Um, nictinamide, and that's the N component. This is the A component, this is the adenine. And the D stands for the dinucleotide, there are two of them. So that's what NAD stands for, this very special molecule. This molecule can pick up electrons, and so when it does, it also picks up, as I said, hydrogen ions. So it becomes NAD, and it's positive, it's lacking electrons. Right? It gains electrons and becomes neutralized and also gains a hydrogen ion. So you can see additional hydrogen here. And then also produces um, an extra proton. So for glycolysis, in this process of breaking down glucose into 2-pyruvate, or sometimes referred to as pyruvic acid, terms are used interchangeably by most instructors. Uh, we won't get into specific chemical differences. They're very similar. Um, so then the pyruvate will get changed into uh, two acetyl-CoA's, the two pyruvates into two acetyl-CoA's, and a carbon atom is lost in the form of carbon dioxide. 
that acetyl-CoA can then now enter into the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle or the TCA cycle, right? The tricarboxylic acid is what TCA stands for. Um, electrons that are broken and taken away from this molecule are then um, transported to electron transport chain. That's why it's called oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative referring to electrons, right? The loss of electrons um, in the process. So um, the coenzymes are those electron carrier, that NADH, that's picking up electrons from these processes from glycolysis and from the breakdown in the Krebs cycle um, are going to give their electrons to the electron transport chain. In that process, they're able to generate the synthesis of ATP. This is another modified uh, nucleotide. The adding of the phosphate, the third phosphate to that modified nucleotide stores that energy in that bond. So when you break that bond, when you break ATP into ADP again, you're releasing that energy, right? So that's one way of carrying this energy around in the cell and storing it. So for mo microbes that respire aerobically, oxygen is that final electron acceptor. So those electrons that go to the electron transport chain are then accepted by oxygen. And metabolic water forms in that process. For other organisms that respire anaerobically and do use an electron transport chain, they're just giving those electrons to some other molecule. So this is an example here of hydrogen sulfate um, made into hydrogen sulfide. Again, it's accepting electrons, and in this case, they're also forming water. Alternatively, carbohydrates, sugars, right, glucose, things like that, can be oxidized. They're broken down. They're taking electrons, and the carbon is given off in the form of carbon dioxide. Some of their free energy, of course, as I said, is trapped in ATP that can be used later. Uh, reduction always accompanies oxidation, right? So you've got that loss of electrons from glucose, and then later it's going to be added to oxygen to form water, right? Those electrons have to go somewhere. So here's glucose, it's a six carbon sugar. For each carbon, there is a water molecule. That's why they're commonly referred to as carbohydrates. So right at the substrate level, it's called substrate level phosphorylation because right at the enzymatic level, some ATP is produced. It doesn't have to be generated by the electron transport chain. But here's that electron carrier that I pointed out earlier, that NAD. It's picking up electrons right, um, and taking them away from the carbon, from the glucose, and we're forming um, two pyruvate or pyruvic acids. This is um, a particular pathway of glycolysis, uh, the Emin meyerhoff paris prennis which a lot of times this guy's name gets left off, right, it's the third guy, it's chopped off. There is the edin duderhoff pathway, which is, which is, again, another way of breaking down glucose, but the yield is a little bit different, just one ATP, one um, NADH, and then one, one NADPH, a different electron carrier. Um, so most of the time you learn about um, the, the first one, this process. So once we have pyruvate, that can then um, be converted have acetyl-CoA added to it, this CoA component, this coenzyme. Um, you lose a carbon dioxide, so you're losing a carbon in the process, and uh, the electron carrier NADH picks up some more electrons to bring to the electron transport chain. So notice the carbon here, right, is given off in carbon dioxide. As I said, the acetyl-CoA is added to the molecule. You have... Um, hydrogens that are picked up, right, along with electrons. And here we still have carbon, we still have two carbons that are going to enter into the Krebs cycle. This is the step before the Krebs cycle. So acetyl-CoA enters into the Krebs cycle by binding with a, a four carbon sugar oxalisate. Um, when that happens, the acetyl-CoA the CoA releases from the acetyl group, 
Um, notice water is used in this process. Some protons are produced and citrate forms, which is another reason why it's sometimes referred to as the citric acid cycle. Or the tricarboxylic acid because this molecule citrate has three carboxyl groups on it. Right at the substrate level, GTP is produced, which is very similar to ATP. Right? It's just a different modified nucleotide. Same process there, it's storing energy. Uh, more electron carriers pick up electrons from it. So you have three NADs to become NADHs picking up electrons that it's then going to take to the electron transport chain. Um, F, FAD, another electron carrier, also picks up electrons. Notice that the carbon is given off. Right, the two carbons that entered in are given off as carbon dioxide, and the oxalate is regenerated. So this cycle starts over again. Right, picks up more acetyl-CoA um, from the breakdown of glucose into pyruvate, forming the acetyl-CoA that that gateway step. And this cycle can go over and over and over again. So again, substrate level, a little bit of energy produced here. Um, but a lot of reduction of coenzymes, these electron carriers, um, gaining electrons that they're going to then bring to the electron transport chain. Carbon, right, lost electrons, it's been oxidized. Our citrate test detects organisms that can take up citrate from the media, not whether they can do the citric acid cycle, whether they can actually take that particular sugar source from the media. In that process, they also are going to use the only nitrogen source in that media. When they do that, they produce a basic product. They produce ammonia. And that's actually what causes the color change that you guys are detecting, right? And so we'll, we'll talk about that again as we go over um, that test. But important point there, right? We're not seeing if they can do the Krebs cycle. We're seeing if they can take that particular sugar in and use it as a carbon source. So um, the electron transport chain, um, the electron carriers are going to transport it. It's embedded within membranes. These are proteins embedded within the membrane. The same thing for FADH2. It donates its electrons to the electron transport chain. When this happens, some of the proteins in the electron transport chain prompt protons, so hydrogen ions, just the proton component of that atom across the membranes. These can't move across, these charged ions can't move across the membranes on their own. So in this case, they're pumped across. So for NADH, it'll do that three times. For FADH, it only does it twice, right? Because it enters um, the cycle at a different point. It doesn't enter here, so it doesn't have that extra one. Notice again, at the end, the electrons are given to oxygen to form water. Right? That's where the electrons go. So for our cells, this happens within the mitochondria. Right? So it happens within the inner membranes of the mitochondria um, is where the electron transport chain is located. Uh, glycolysis, though, on the other hand, happens outside the mitochondria. And then it's going to transport that stuff inside. So we have some loss of energy having to transport into the mitochondria. For um, bacterial cells, this happens right in their cell membrane. Um, so that proton gradient, those protons being pumped across one side of the membrane, right, and being stored in that intermembrane space, when it travels back, it's going to travel through a special uh, protein in the membrane that allows the protons to travel back. That force of the, them wanting to travel back to where they came from, to that area where there's a less concentration now that we've created a greater concentration outside, creates a, a, a force, a chemical force that helps generate the energy necessary to add the phosphate to ADP to form ATP. So. It's almost like how water can be used to turn a turbine, right, and generate energy. The same thing, that flow of those molecules is enough to generate the energy 
to make that bond. Again, because it's electrons that are giving us this power ultimately, it's referred to as oxidative phosphorization, that phosphate's being added because of the movement of electrons. So another thing that can happen for organisms that utilize an electron transport chain in the presence of oxygen is that sometimes electrons will leave the electron transport chain and bind with oxygen without the addition of the protons and you get a highly reactive, dangerous form of oxygen known as superoxide radicals. So this happens in our bodies, happens in our cells, it happens for your organisms that are aerobic really re respiring. Because they're in an oxygen environment and this potential can happen, they form this damaging form. Another damaging form that can happen uh, when electrons leave the electron transport chain and bind with oxygen, but also with some hydrogen, is hydrogen peroxide, right? And so this is what we were using for our test today, right? We were actually adding hydrogen peroxide to our organisms because we wanted to see if they could break down. Do they have the enzyme that helps protect them against this toxic form of oxygen? What's that enzyme? Catalase, right? So for the catalase text, we take hydrogen peroxide, so we purposely expose them to it to see if they can break it down into water and gaseous oxygen. And because it, it's in that gas form, that's why it bubbles. So there's an old wise tale that some people sometimes tell that um, if you pour hydrogen peroxide on a wound and it doesn't bubble, doesn't means that it's not infected. This is a wise tale. This is not true. This means that you probably just poured water on yourself. Hydrogen peroxide over time, due to light, it will break down into water and oxygen. Not just catalase can cause this reaction. Light can help catalyze the reaction. Metal, as we found out, right, today we didn't want to use a metal loop and hydrogen peroxide because then we wouldn't know what was causing the bubbling. So that's also why it's kept in a dark bottle. They, scientists also, healthcare workers, are suggesting people not using it for wound care anymore because it is destructive to even our cells. You are catalase positive, right? You have this enzyme. So if you have a wound, right, and you're pouring this on your cells, it should always bubble right? Because you are catalase positive. You're aerobic, right? You have electron transport chain. You live in an oxygen environment. You form hydrogen peroxide sometimes. So you have catalase to help detoxify. So use it to clean other things. Your earrings, right? That may have bacteria on it. Bubbles like crazy. It's great, right? Your clothing, all kinds of things that can be used to clean with, right? You can even rinse your mouth with it, although I wouldn't suggest it. It's quite nasty. Um, but they add it to tons of cleaners and such nowadays. It really is a really effective cleaner under certain circumstances, right? Because that bubbling action is also um, very helpful. Uh, but don't use it on your wounds. Plain old soap and water and a little bit of triple antibiotic ointment. It's your best course of action. So the reaction, right, that happens for the most part Glucose is a very common source of energy, even for ourselves. And so with the combination of water, these electron carriers, we can generate energy right at the substrate level, ATP and GTP. But then these electron carriers can go to the electron transport chain and generate a lot more energy. All the carbon is given off in the form of carbon dioxide. So carbon loses its, its electron, so it becomes oxidized. The electron carriers become reduced, right? These coenzymes, they've gained the electrons. We have some, as I said, substrate level phosphorization, a little bit of energy that's produced. But most of the energy from the breakdown of glucose is from the electron transport chain. For each molecule of NADH, you're going to generate three ATPs, because remember we pumped three hydrogen ions across three sets of hydrogen ions. Where FADH, there's, there was only two pumps, so you only get two hydrogen ions. But in this process, when you break down glucose, notice that you get 10 NADHs in four FADH2s. 
So if you do your multiplication there, you end up with possible of 38 ATPs generated from the electron carriers that bring the electrons to the electron transport chain. In eukaryotes, it's only around 36 because, again, that whole movement of the molecules from the outside of the mitochondria to the inside, you lose about 2 ATP in that transport process. 4 ATPs were generated, right, if you just consider GTP and ATP is the same, um, at, at the substrate level, right, 34 were from the oxidative um, electron transport chain, oxidative phosphorization. So that's the theoretical yield, right? Uh, what you could potentially maximum yield. The actual yield is around 29 to 30 ATPs per glucose molecule. Um, and again, once we get that energy back out of the ATP, isn't quite the same amount of energy that we generated putting it in. Um, so you get about 33%. So I had posted these YouTube videos, some of us, right, seeing chemical reactions moving, and then there's the funny one where the guy sings a rap song, right, about um, this process. So if an organism lacks an electron transport chain, how does it recycle that coenzyme, that electron carrier, NADH? It has no place to put the electrons, right? It's electron transport chain. So we can't keep breaking down glucose if this electron carrier can't give away its electrons. Right? So it runs into a problem. It's got to dump them off somewhere. So it's going to give it to some organic molecule, usually something from the breakdown of glucose. So in that process, we, f we form alcohols, gases, and acids. This process is called fermentation. And typically, again, it happens on an anaerobic environment because for some organisms, they're not using their electron transport chain because they don't have oxygen, right? So they're going to do fermentation instead. Some of them don't have it at all, right? And so therefore they just do fermentation all the time. And then others, of course, don't need oxygen to use their electron transport chains, right? These are some of the anaerobes um, that are out there. But so they have some choices. And there's lots of choices when it comes to fermentation. So just from something like breaking down glucose into pruvic acid, they can remove a carbon dioxide and form formaldehyde. This can accept the electrons from NADH from that glycolysis step and form one of our favorite alcohols, good old ethanol, right? So Saccharomyces, um, one of the yeasts that we looked at at the beginning of the semester referred to as Baker's or Brewer, Brewer's yeast, right, generates alcohol under certain circumstances, certain sugars. And it's doing that through fermentation. Um, another choice is, and notice also gas production, carbon dioxide is produced in that process. And that's what really helps um, bread rise, right, why they would use yeast um, it's actually the carbon dioxide that helps um, the bread rise. So um, they can take the formaldehyde and add another pyruvate to it and form um, alpha acetolactate. These are tongue twisters for me sometimes. Get rid of some carbon dioxide and form acetonin. Not the same thing as acetone, ladies, that we used to take nail polish off, right? Different chemical. Okay, so this acetonin should have been in your questions for homework for today, right? Because we're detecting the presence of this acid, right, in one of our tests. Anyone know which one? The VP test, right? So... The electrons can then be given to acetonin and form 2,3-butanol. This is an alcohol, and this was the type of fermentation we were testing to see if your organism could do with the voss proskauer or the VP test today. So the acetonin is an intermediate. This is a rate-limiting step, so you have plenty of acetonin usually in the sample right, that we can react with and get that positive red result. And then we know your organism can make 2,3-butanol. We're not actually testing specifically for 2,3-butanol, but the intermediate.
Pruvic acid um, can pick up the electrons from NADH and form lactic acid. This happens in our bodies, right, under low oxygen um, situations where we can't use our electron transport chain. Lactobacilli also do this, and this is the sour component. The lactic acid is a sour component in sourdough bread. Um, lactobacilli are also crucial for the uh, female vagina. This is what creates the acids that makes the normal low pH that we have in our vagina, those normal flora that are associated. And then, as I said, we produce this, unfortunately, sometimes in our muscles. This is not a good situation, right, when we don't have enough oxygen um, under anaerobic conditions. Um, you could go from lactate to propionic acid, but no organisms that evolve this particular step for getting to propionic acid. Instead, um, they add carbon dioxide to oxalate. Remember, this is one of the intermediates in the Krebs cycle. They use a lot of the same enzymes and stuff and just use them to go in different directions. Um, in this case, then the NADH is added to oxalate, which forms succinate. Again, notice similar steps that are from the Krebs cycle, similar enzymes, and then they form propanate. Um, and Peter's a real stickler for really specific chemical, right? So it, it isn't truly pruvate, but a derivative of pruvate that goes to the process even. So um, pruvic acid can pick up um, acetyl-CoA, uh, form acetyl-CoA, right? This is the gateway step to the Krebs cycle. But again, if you go into the Krebs cycle, you're going to generate 10 um, for each molecule of glucose, NADHs, and four FADHs. If you, you can't go to the electron transport chain, there's no point entering into the Krebs cycle because you're going to generate all these electron carriers that they have no place for them to go. Um, but again, they can use different steps of the Krebs cycle and generate different products and dump off electrons there. So in doing that, they produce and there's a whole slew, right? These are just some of the pathways we've gone over. By no means I expect you guys to memorize any of them, but just have a general understanding. You should be familiar with some of this stuff even from um, biology class. I'm waiting on an important phone call, so I was just making sure that was not it. They, I was like, they, I know they're going to call me during lab. They're just going to do that to me. Okay, so... The bottom line is lots of times acids, alcohols, and ketones are produced. So here's another example, right, of, again, a different way of generating that acetyl-CoA. In this case, no redox reaction, no electrons are exchanged, where here there is an electron exchange. Notice the carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas produced here, right, uh, very common products. And then the acids that are produced. For the methyl red test, right, that was just a pH test. And that's for a very low pH, 4.4 or lower. So in this case, your organism has produced a lot of acid, right, to have that low of a pH. So gas production under anaerobic conditions is very common. So um, this poor dead animal, the bloat that sometimes they experience, is uh, Clostridium perfigens. Um, this also sometimes causes a condition that's referred to as gas gangrene. Um, and because when organisms are dead, this organism, which is a spore former and in the environment, can grow. And when it grows, it ferments and it produces gas. And so a lot of times, if you're still alive when this is happening, right, you get this bubbly um, discharge from the wound. Um, but that's also why they will bloat right, if an animal is dead um, from this organism growing. Hydrogen gas is very flammable, right, um, and the most um, no, noteworthy explosion was the Hindenburg because um, it was feel, filled with hydrogen gas. For blimps and stuff nowadays, they use helium, which is a lighter than air gas but is not explosive and also kind of fun to play with, right. Um, but... Uh, yeah, hydrogen is explosive. We don't play around with hydrogen gas. 
That's why fermentation and fermentations that happen can sometimes lead to really bad explosions, hence the moonshine people and all that fun stuff, because um, you're doing fermentation, right? And buildup of gases can happen, and even flammable gas like hydrogen. Um, so common acids that are produced, in the, and the number just denotes how many carbons that that particular acid has. So formate is just a one carbon acid. Um, so you have acetate, uh, propanate, and lactate butyrate, succinate, these are very common acids that are byproducts of fermentation, of dumping those electrons off to um, uh, pyruvate and forming these different acids. Lots of different alcohols are formed, methanol, ethanol, isopropanol, butanol, and 2,3-butanol uh, that we um, looked for today, if our organisms could do that. Ketones are also produced. Uh, these are acidic. Um, so this is acetone. Um, gases, carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas. Um, carbon dioxide, as you know, when we respire, we produce it, right? So if we were detecting carbon dioxide from an organism, we wouldn't necessarily know whether they were fermenting or they produced that by aerobic respiration unless we could test specifically for that. But hydrogen gas, on the other hand, is unique to fermentation. That is only produced under fermentation um, conditions. Methanol um, is toxic to humans. Um, it interferes with our electron transport chain. Um, and so it can lead to serious blindness. Um, and the reason for that is because um, our optic nerve is, is always working, right? And so it's always respiring and so damaging its electron transport chain associated with those nerve cells can lead to permanent blindness, permanent damage. So. Don't mess around with methanol, right? Um, so for mixed acid fermentation, the test that determines if your organism is doing mixed acid fermentation, if it's producing a lot of acids, was methyl red. What was the reagent we used for this test? Methyl red. And why did we use it? What is methyl red? It's a pH indicator. That's all it is. And that's why we could read the test immediately. So what do the products of this type of fermentation do to the pH of the media? Nope. Makes it acidic, right? Acids make it acidic, which means the pH does what? It goes down, right? The pH goes down. Lowers the pH. Acids have a low pH. So as I said, protons, right? Very important molecules for biochemical systems. A hydrogen atom is just a proton and an electron, right? These atoms use, lose their electrons a lot of times and become free protons. What pH is the measure actually of is the partial pressure of hydrogen ions, right? P stands for partial pressure, H stands for hydrogen ions. So the pH is actually a negative log, right? So it's the reciprocal. So in the case of pH, we know 7 is neutral, right? This is a balance in hydrogen ion concentrations in a solution. When you have a low pH, this is actually a high hydrogen ion concentration. Because notice it's negative here. So minus 10 is smaller than minus 4. And that's where the numbers come. It's the, it's the log, right, to the power of 10 of how many hydrogen ions you're dealing with. So low pH is anything below 7. So around 4 would be considered acidic, right? Anything above 7 is considered basic or sometimes referred to as alkaline. So the relationship low pH is actually high hydrogen ion concentration for acidic conditions. Under basic conditions, hydrogen ions are low, pH is high. The pH number is high. It's an inverse relationship. So there's lots of pH indicators out there. Even one of the dyes that we use, you'll notice crystal violet, can detect acids, right, in the acid range. Um, phenol red, 
which we used in our phenol red tubes, right? That's why they're called phenol red. Um, as you can see, around neutral, they're reddish, right? They can even go pink in the basic range. It's kind of hard to see in this, but we'll look at other pictures. But under, right, very, not much, right? Just below and neutral just is yellow, right? So if you were yellow in that test, it was just, you just had to be slightly acidic right, for the phenol red test. For the methyl red test, on the other hand, in order to stay red, right, you've got to be down in this lower range, this 4.4 range. Above that, it's around 5.5 uh, or so. It's, it's kind of orange and then yellow. And that's why it seemed like it disappeared if your organism was negative, right, because it ends up being the same color as the media. And it starts out red, right, we have it at a red pH. Uh, Bromenthal blue, this one, again, around neutral notice is green, is about where we started with that slant media. And then when it was basic, when alkaline products were produced, it turns blue. So those are some of the pH indicators that we've utilized. Which test detects this type of fermentation, the 2,3-butanol? We answered this, right? The Vogs Press Cower, the VP. I promise I won't make you guys spell any of these. Okay, it's hard enough to pronounce them, right? We commonly abbreviate it. What are the reagents used? So there was a couple of reagents we used, right? Two of them. The Barrett's reagent A, which was alpha nethaphthenol, and the Barrett's reagent B, which was the potassium hydroxide. This was that strong base, which is why we wanted to protect ourselves. Again, I won't make you spell these, but you do need to be able to recognize what you use in these procedures. What immediate, what intermediate product did we detect the presence of? Acetonin. The order does matter, which reagent you add <laughs> first. Um, which is why I help walk you guys through this too. It's also why, obviously, they have one labeled A and the other one B. And the mixing was very important. So this biochemical pathway is a series of reactions that take place within some bacteria. So again, they're going to break down glucose into pruvate, um, form uh, uh, alpha-acetolactate, ac right, and then acetonin. This acetonin can then be converted into 2,3-butanol. We can test for the presence of acetonin by combining it with the alpha-nethaphthenol, our first reagent, um, and then we add the potassium hydroxide, and we also need oxygen, notice for this equation. That binds with um, the, the formation of the diacetyl that happens and the guanine that's in the media to begin with and produces a red color. In a chemical reaction that can be slow, it can take up to one hour to complete. So that's why we were checking in at 10-minute intervals, right, to um, look for our results. I don't think anybody saw this weird copper color, but this was another reason why, again, if it was questionable, I came and looked at them. You usually get a nice true, or some semesters we've had kind of a purplish red color, right? But usually it's pretty distinct. So for both of these tests, what were we looking for for a positive result? Red, right? Um, for the methyl red test, it's because it's at that low pH, it's going to stay red, right? Otherwise, it would turn orange to yellow. So orange is kind of on the border, and that's why I kind of um, retested some of you guys that came out orange. Um, So for which of these tests, each group is going to do 
uh, negative and positive controls, which I actually did. But why do we do controls? We had those pictures to go by, but if you didn't have those pictures to go by, right, doing ones that you know are supposed to come out positive, negative would have something to go by, and also to let you know that your reagents, right, are good, that they're working properly. So we can compare and evaluate. And so I had done this previously, right, previous before I even did in the lab to make sure that our reagents and everything was working properly before today's lab. So we already did this, right? We did our one mil in each one of our tubes and we ran these two separate tests that can be run on that same media. Um, that's why it's abbreviated MRVP, right? MR for methyl red, VP for the vox Proskauer test. Would a false negative result for the VP test more likely be attributed to poor sensitivity or specificity of the test? Sensitivity, right? Whether you can actually truly see that red color. Specificity refers to what you're testing for. And this is a pretty specific test, right? We're doing a chemical reaction that's going to re react with acetonin. So the problem we run into is sensitivity. Do we have enough acetonin? to interact with the molecules to create that red color change that we can see with our eyes. So when acetone is quickly converted to the end product, there will be very little amounts of the intermediate product left to detect. There are other circumstances when the concentration of acetone might be low. For example, perhaps acetone lingers around for a long time, a particular species of bacteria but much, not, not much acetonin was generated in the first place due to very low inoculum, right? You might not have had enough. These cultures have been going for much longer than they're supposed to, right? So we shouldn't have had any uh, false negative results. We've had some weird false positives. I don't know what that's about other than possible contamination or what. I'm not sure. Um, whether the concentration of the acetonin, for whatever reason, is below the limit of detection of the VP assay, you will get a negative result, right? And for some organisms, this would potentially be a false negative. Why were you told to shake the VP tubes after reagents were added? Right, especially after the second one, we need oxygen for this reaction to happen. So flicking that tube adds the oxygen into the liquid and allows the reaction to proceed. There's my methyl red. So again, remember, this is just a quick pH test. That's why we were able to read these results immediately. All right? And so orange or yellow is not red, right? Just red is a true positive result. It means you have that very low pH, that lots of acids have been produced. So E. coli is an example of a, a very strong mixed acid fermenter. You can see here it produces a lot of acids, lactate, acetate, formate, succinate. Um, it also will produce alcohol, hydrogen gas, and carbon dioxide gas. All those acids, right, really significantly lower the pH. We don't know for your organisms particularly what acids they're producing, but definitely that they're probably producing more than one acid, which is why you have such a low pH and why you're positive for the methyl red test. Why is the methyl red test red immediately where the volks praskauer is red after 60 minutes? So again, what's the methyl red test? It's just a simple pH test. Where... For the vox Proskauer, what are we waiting for to happen? A chemical reaction. And those sometimes take time. Where pH detection is immediate. Some microbiologists recommend re-incubating organisms producing methyl red negative results for an additional two to three days. Why do you think this is done? Yeah, the longer it's incubating, the more time it has produced more gases. I mean, more acids. Gas would be true too. 
but we're not detecting that in this test. Um, for these, right, we've been incubating for a couple of weeks, actually. So, like I said, we shouldn't have any problem with that. So I'm not going to go over the scientific method, right? You guys can read this on your own. We've been going over this numerous times, right? Um, so, phenol red. So this is named after the pH indicator that's used in this test. There's a code that we use when we code the results. A stands for acid, G for gas, minus for no gas production, minus minus for no color change, no gas production, and K for the alkaline products, this pink color that you see. So there's lots of sugars that we could test for, right? Um, but we tested for glucose in our particular test. In the media, there is a protein source, a digested protein source. This actually comes from milk, gives milk its white color, um, casing this particular protein. Um, salt for isotonic balance. The glucose, because we want to know if they can ferment it. The phenol red to help us detect the changes in the pH that happen. Um, and then, of course, good old water. And the pH is adjusted to around neutral. So they have every organism needs a nitrogen source, amino acids, proteins are a good nitrogen source, and a carbon source. Um, and in this case, it can be also used for energy, um, for, the carb for the glucose. So in general terms, what are some of the common end products of pruvate fermentation, or fermentation in general? Acids, alcohols, and gases. Right? Gases are hydrogen and carbon dioxide. Alcohols, there's numerous ones as we've seen, and lots of different acids. Which can we detect with this test, or should I say, which one can we not detect? Can we detect gas? Yeah, the Durham tube, right? Helps us trap the gas. Can we detect alcohols? No. Can we detect acids? Yes, the pH indicator helps us detect acid. So what's the pH indicator? Phenol red. Right? It's going to be reddish or orange and reddish around neutral. It really turns this bright pinkish color, right? You guys can see in the demo racks, right? That really cool magenta pink color. Um, when it's alkaline, but when it's acidic, it turns yellow. Right? And that's definitely what we're looking for in terms of fermentation. We're looking for that yellow color. So it turns what color when acid's produced? Yellow. yellow. Right? And again, it's not a very low pH. It's around 6, 6.5, just below neutral. What color does the media turn if alkaline products are generated? So this is that magenta or pink up around 8.5 to 9. What does the Durham tube help us detect? Gas, right? And we see this as a void, right, where there's no, where there's a bubble in the tube. If glucose is fermented, what's going to happen to the pH? Fermentation produces what that changes pH? It's going to lower the pH, right, because acids are produced, right, and it's going to turn what color again? Yellow. Peptone, right, that protein source, that casein that they're going to digest, is a component in the media. Some of them aren't going to ferment the sugar. Instead, they're going to deaminate, they're going to break down the protein source. When they do that, they are going to change the pH of the media. In this case, it's going to go basic. The pH is going to go up, right? And you're going to get that pink color. So in this case, it's a loss of hydrogen ions, right? Production of the ammonia. Decrease in hydrogen ions. Increase pH. Decarboxylization, amino acids have all have a carboxyl group and an amino group, right? So sometimes they're decarboxylated, carbon dioxide is produced, 
Other times they're deaminated where they remove the amino group, right? And so this is what's making the media basic, right? This is what's um, absorbing hydrogens and making the uh, media basic. This can be used to pick up electron carriers even, right? We can break down proteins. We can utilize proteins. So in this case, it's picking up electrons that can go to the electron transport chain. For diabetics, right, this will sometimes happen where they break down amino acids because they can't get the sugar into their cells. Um, this that forms, um, this, this keto acid that forms from the breakdown of amino acids is what causes people to go acidic, um, go into what they call aceto keto uh, acidosis, right? And again, it's from the formation of acids from the breakdown of proteins that can happen to diabetics. And this is bad because they could, um, their blood uh, pH level can really go high in this, um, go low, acidic, right? Their acids, acidic, it's going to be low pH. Um, and they can um, slip into a coma and die, right? So it's a very serious condition uh, for people who are diabetic. So decarboxylization, again, it's removing the carboxyl group. So here's an amino acid that's being broken down. This is another example, uh, but this is deamination, where the amino group is being removed. Again, either can be done depending on what the organism needs from proteins. Um, but they can be broken down for energy as well. Not the preferred form, especially when you have acid products being formed. So when microbiologists sometimes do these tests, they would do a tube that doesn't contain the sugar, just has the protein source, and the standard tubes that you guys did that had the protein and the sugar. So what that table in your guys' book is looking at is if you were to run those controls, which we, we did not, right, um, which would help you um, know reliability of your tests. We don't have to worry about that, right? Like I said, I know what your results are supposed to be. Right? So we would know if there was any serious abnormalities or problems with our media. So your organisms actually had a choice. Glucose and protein were in your tubes. We know if they, if they fermented the glucose, right, because it produces what change? Fermentation is going to produce what? Well, they ferment the sugar to produce what? Acids gases and alcohols, right? So what's a good indication in these tubes that they have eaten the sugar? Acid production, right? Even gas would give you a clue as well, but the acid definitely is going to happen whether they do the gas or not. If they eat the protein though, remember what I say is what's going to happen? They're going to deaminate it so we get that amino, am ammonia product, which is basic, so pH goes up, right, and the color turns pink. So Carolyn got one of the special organisms that's kind of like me, right? Given the choice between sugar and protein, especially right now with the Halloween candy in the house, it's really bad, right? So I'll be eating the candy bar while the hamburger is cooking, right? While my protein is cooking, I can't wait, right? I'm into the Halloween candy. Most organisms are like that, some organisms are like that too, right? Where they're going to eat the sugar first. That's quick, fast energy. Then they'll move on to the protein. So what's going to happen though to our pH? So when they eat the sugar first, it's going to turn what? Yellow, right? But then when they start eating the protein, yeah, the pH is going to start going in the other direction, right? So remember it goes yellow orange at neutral, and then pink. So I had to put hers in the incubator because I had to put it in the refrigerator because if I left it in the incubator, guess what color that tune was going to turn on you? It was going to turn pink. And you would not know that it ate the sugar first. Right? Make sense? So this is why typically we read these after 48 hours. There's only a couple of organisms that will keep eating, so I usually refrigerate them. Right, and Carolyn got one of those lucky ones this time, so I had to put hers in the fridge so it wouldn't turn pink. Right?
But with protein only, right, if we had done the protein only tubes, what's the only color change we could get? If they only have the choice of protein, no sugar to ferment, the tubes can only turn what? Pink. Right? So in this table, which is a good one for you guys to fill out and get practice, Notice that this first set of tubes, right, contain both the protein and the glucose. So you have all the possible combination can happen, just like you guys had for your unknowns. But if we had done a control set that only contained protein, your only possibility is a potentially pink tube or no change at all. So if we end up with a yellow color, right, or gas production in these protein-only tubes, what does that tell you? Something's not right, right, because you're only supposed to get that from sugar. So somehow, right, somebody screwed up. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't trust your results because there's been a mistake that's been made, right, and you'd have to repeat. Does that make sense to you guys? So as we look at each one of these, when you think about it in those terms, it's very easy to interpret here. Right? Remember, these are all the possibilities that we can happen. Right? If you have glucose, you can get acid and gas production. You can have a yellow tube, right, which indicates A for acid, and you can have gas production from that fermentation, G denoting that you see a bubble in that Durham tube. Could you, in a protein-only tube, get acid and gas production? Could you have a yellow tube with a gas bubble if you have truly only protein? No. So are these reliable results? Absolutely not. Right? Could you have nothing happen in that protein tube? Yeah. Can you have an organism eat the sugar and ferment it, but when given the choice of only protein, deaminate the protein? Yes. Right? Does that make sense to you guys? So like her organism, right, if I just give it straight up protein, it would have went right to eating the protein. For this next one, could you have acid and no gas production in a protein-only tube? No. Something went wrong, right? Given the choice, this organism, right, got coded K, which means it was a pink tube, which means it deaminated the protein. So given the choice between sugar and protein, it chose protein. It can do that. And then, of course, we would expect it to do the same thing if only we give it protein, right? If it ate the protein given a choice between sugar and protein, and then given no choice protein only, it should do the same thing. And if it does, then our results would be reliable. Well, what happens if they don't do anything with it, right? They, they had a choice here, sugar or protein, right? And they chose protein. But over here, given just protein, nothing happened. Is that a reliable result? No, they should have ate it again, right? Why didn't they eat the protein? They did it the first time when given a choice even. They chose protein over sugar. Here, acid, no gas production, and our sugar protein tube. But then when given just protein, they decided to eat the protein. Would this be a reliable result? Yeah. Right. Here they're preferring sugar. Here, when they're given just protein, they're like, okay, fine, I'll eat it. No Halloween candy today. This is a protein-only tube. Can you get gas and acid production? Can you ferment proteins? No, that's not a reliable result. And where the heck did the gas come from? Look at in this tube, we didn't even have any gas, and all of a sudden you're generating gas over here? 
What went wrong? Major questions. So suppose you inoculate a tube with a slow-growing fermenter. So I'm telling you, it ferments, right? It's just slow about it, okay? So you see turbidity, you see there's growth, but the tube is no gas production, it's still orange. Is this a false positive or false negative? False negative, right? It should be yellow, right? But enough time hasn't gone by, they haven't produced enough acid. So is this a question of sensitivity or specificity? This is sensitivity, right? Not enough acid to make that pH indicator change to yellow. So early formulations of this media had just a small amount of carbohydrates in it. So what happened is, especially for organisms like Carolyn's, right, they ate up all that sugar, moved on to eating the protein, so you came back after 48 hours, you saw a pink tube, right? And so you think, oh, well, they just ate the protein. But that's not true. Right, so they ate up all the sugar and then started eating the protein. So how could we change this? Add more sugar, and that's what they've done, right? So we can incubate for 48 hours, and if you look right then, you should catch them eating the sugar before they move on to the protein. What else could we do? Well, we, we want to know if they're going to, some of them are just going to eat protein, and we want to know that. But that and you've got to provide that ammonia source so they can't grow. Um, so we can't eliminate the protein. What were you going to say, Fong? Right, check it before 48, maybe 24 hours, right? Check it before they eat up all the sugar. So you could change the length of incubation, or you could add more sugar. In this case, they added more sugar. So, as I said, I'm going to skip over scientific. Brings us to the citrate test. So the citrate test, as I said, is not can they do the citric acid cycle. It's can they bring citrate, which is the only carbon source in the media, into the cell. And for cells to be able to bring stuff in, they have to have special proteins in their membranes. So... Your organism, if it brought citrate in, has citrate permease. Granted, this is a sucrose one. I couldn't find citrate. But again, same principle. There is a sugar. There is a protein that helps transport specific sugars into the cells. So if your cell has citrate permease, it has that protein embedded in its membrane, and it can bring citrate into the cell. So the only carbon source was citrate, sodium citrate, in that media. That's it. And one nitrogen source, ammonium dihydrogen phosphate. Organisms have to have those two sources or they can't survive. Since this media only has these two, you've got two choices, citrate and the ammonium. So what happens if they can't bring them citrate into their cells. They die. They die. And that's why those of you guys that had green tubes should have not seen any growth. And if you saw anything, it might have been the original organisms you stuck on there. You might have put too much. Right? It's not growth. So what color, uh, what pH indicator, first of all, is Bromenthal blue. And this one, again, is going to help us detect when the pH goes basic, and that's going to be blue, right? Above 7, it's going to be this nice, pretty blue. Some of you guys had nice, pretty blue tubes. So, again, it's going to be blue. Increase pH, decrease hydrogen ions. And that's when they're utilizing the ammonia source. So if the media is green and you see growth of the organism in the tube, is this a positive result 
this would be, right? But as I said, for you guys, at this point, if you were seeing anything, that may have been maybe contamination or you put too much bacteria in there to begin with, right? Um, but if you saw growth, you would let it go longer to help uh, produce more of the ammonium so that you get that color change. But again, true growth cannot happen unless the organism has citrate permease, is actually utilizing the citrate. So the problem would be, right, if you recorded that negative, not enough ammonia. So again, is this sensitivity issue or specificity? This is a sensitivity issue. Last one, catalase. So we also had a little bit of a preview on this one as we were talking about the pathways. So flavoprotein is that electron carrier that sometimes makes that mistake and adds those extra electrons to oxygen and forms the toxic forms of oxygen that we mentioned. You have two enzymes, superoxide demutase. This one converts that superoxide into hydrogen peroxide and safe form of oxygen. And then we go one step further, sometimes when that hydrogen peroxide is produced or when we are detoxifying the superoxide into hydrogen peroxide, we then have catalase. Catalase converts the hydrogen peroxide into water in gaseous oxygen, right? And that's why we see the bubbling. So whether superoxide is produced or hydrogen peroxide is produced, superoxide is converted into hydrogen peroxide, and then hydrogen peroxide is broken down by catalase. So we, did, we tested this two different ways, right? We did it on a glass slide. And we also did it right on one of our um, slant tubes where the organisms were growing. And again, we can see this reaction within seconds. If you see bubbles, it means that catalase is present, right? That reaction is happening. Would a false positive from the reaction between the inoculating loop and the hydrogen peroxide be caused by poor specificity or sensitivity? This is the one specificity issue, right, where you don't know what's causing the reaction. Is it the loop or your organism? And this is why performing that procedure correctly is important. So if you've ever cleaned um, silverware or metal jewelry, again, a bubbling you might see is because of the reaction of the metal with the hydrogen peroxide. And as I said before, light also can cause this reaction. So your hydrogen peroxide goes bad over time. Of course, if you use a plastic loop, right, which we did use today, but we still didn't use it um, in conjunction with the hydrogen peroxide, you wouldn't have that problem. It's the metal. So if a weakly catalase positive organism initially gives a weak positive result recorded as a negative, right? You don't see the bubbles. Um, would this be poor sensitivity or specificity? This is a sensitivity issue. And this could be improved and say you looked at the slide under the microscope, right? Might help you see tiny little bubbles forming. But we also just go ahead and do it on the slant. So why would it advise that you perform this test on a known catalase positive? Right, have a control, and we're using hydrogen peroxide, and what did I say happens to our hydrogen peroxide over time? The light will cause that reaction of it turning into water and oxygen. So if I didn't test it on a known positive and get bubbles, you might not have got bubbles because we had bad hydrogen peroxide. You can't tell the difference between water and hydrogen peroxide, right? 
Unless, of course, if you decided to drink it, then that would be really bad news. So we want to make sure that our reagent is good. All right? Why we keep it in a dark bottle? You're going to keep it closed tightly. So what's the purpose of adding the hydroperoxide to unalkylated tube? So why did I do that? It's another control, right? Because if the media causes the reaction, then we don't know, again, when we're putting that in our slant, if it's the media that's causing bubbling or our organism, right? So we need to know that the media does not cause this reaction, and it doesn't, right? I did that one for us to confirm So we didn't have any specificity issue by doing it right on our slants, right? We know, in fact, it is the organism, not the media. So one uh, bonus type question, ponder for you, Fong, why do you think yours doesn't have catalase? It's growing in an aerobic environment, isn't it? But is it aerobically respiring? Maybe not, right? What's the other choices? Can't be an obligate anaerobe, right? It's facultative actually utilize oxygen, right? So they would need catalase. What's the one choice where they wouldn't need catalase? Aerotolerant anaerobes. So this test, um, which you can read about in your guys' book, we used to do this, but these test strips are about 20 bucks a piece. So they're uh, kind of not in our budget anymore. And I lost all my demos when I lost my refrigerator, unfortunately. Uh, but the, each one of these chambers is a different test. And so they would inoculate the entire strip, and then um, based on the results and a booklet that comes with it, you could figure out what organism you had, right? So all these little individual tests we've done for um, organisms that fall into this family, you could run this set of tests. This is one of the ways that they do it in, in clinical labs. They don't do each of the individual tests like we did. Um, so you can see a uh, phenol red test for a bunch of different sugars here. They test four for these groups of organisms. These first couple of chambers have wax in them, um, and this is to create an anaerobic environment. So for the glucose fermentation, when it produces gas, what it does is it pops the wax. And as I said, at one time I had these actual things for you to see, but I don't anymore. Notice again, the citrate test is right here, right? So it can go green and turn blue. Um, and then a bunch of other tests. Um, this is a decarboxylization test of these two amino acids. Um, they can run the VP test, right, by adding the reagents to the chamber after inoculation. Um, uh, this is a, a fermentation test as well as a deamination test of, of um, an amino acid, phenylalanine. Uh, this is a, a different test that, where they can break down urea. A hydrolysis test this is one of my colleagues' favorite because it has this really bright pinkish color um, reaction. It was really pretty to see. Uh, some of us like that pink color. Um, and then, of course, with the acid production for these guys, right, because since it's phenol red, it goes from the red or orangish color to the yellow. And, you know, you can interpret by the colors. This one, too, they can, um, two different reactions can be, run in that. So there's a multitude of tests, right? I forget how many. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen tests all in one strip, right? So you could do them all at once, right? Come back the next day, read the results, and figure out what organism you had. So there's nearly 14,000 different combinations. So there's a booklet that comes with it, right, that helps you interpret your results. All right. I thought I was 